Praise the Lord. From the rising of the sun to its setting, we proclaim. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Restore us, O God of our salvation. As we surrender our hearts and lives to you in worship. So now we have joys and concerns. Do we have any concerns this morning or joys? Joyce? I've had a wonderful blessing. My two of my grandchildren that I don't get to see. At, they just can't just see me. <laughs> I opened the doors and there they were. It was truly an awesome blessing. Amen. Bob? Pastor Dean <coughs> traveling, and remember the cross, Milton. Let's pray. <clears throat> Dear Lord, we thank you for your many blessings. We thank you for this beautiful, beautiful Sunday morning, and the privilege, and the honor, and the freedom that we have to worship you, Lord. We ask you to bless this worship service. <clears throat> we ask you to bless uh, Pastor and Dean as they travel. We ask you to be with the LaCroix family, Lord, and Milton's very dear to our hearts, Lord, and we ask you to bless him. Lord, our city is, has leaders, Lord, and we just ask you to be with them as they make the decisions, be with our schools, be with our country, and Lord, we just ask you to be with us today as we worship, Lord, that you will touch our hearts and lead us to follow you. As you be with Wayne this morning as he gives us our sermon, Lord, and we just thank you so much for his time and commitment, Lord, and for what he's done for our church and other churches, Lord. And Lord, we just ask you to be with those who didn't come in to having a need, Lord, and we know there is needs. Lord, we know you know it. And Lord, we just ask you to bless us and be with us now as we pray, as you taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Please stand. It's a beautiful Sunday morning. Praise God.
This is the praise like the dead man walk again. Open the grave, I'm coming out. I'm gonna live, gonna live again. This is the sound of tribals rattling. This is.
and praise you again and again. Cause all that I have is a hallelujah, hallelujah. And I know it's not much, but I Except for a heart singing hallelujah, hallelujah. I love you, Lord. Oh, you're Before I read the scripture, let me say how happy I am to be back here again. And uh, as I sit here and look out over all of my friends who've not known for uh, a very long time now, um, it's just good to be here. Feels like being home. I have to warn you, I hadn't preached in over a year, and so uh, I've got a lot stored up. So what time do I have to stop? Got time for it? Awesome. All right. All right. Now, it's been uh, quite an adventure over these last few years, and uh, I, I still uh, am, am sorry the day that I moved from here. Uh, this was such a good place, a wonderful place for my, my children, and uh, they're all doing well, grown up, middle-aged. I was telling Mary Ann uh, th this morning that, uh, you know, the last time I stood here, uh, our kids were all the same age. And now I stand here and our grandkids are all the same age. And uh, that's a little hard for me to imagine that so many years have passed. 
least. I left in 2002. So uh, a lot of water under the bridge, and it is good to be back. Our scripture lesson for this morning comes from the Gospel of Luke. And we've been looking at chapter 13, verses 31 through 35. And it reads like this. 20 years, I do have to get the Bible closer. <laughs> at that time, some Pharisees came to Jesus and said to him, Leave this place and go somewhere else. Herod wants to kill you. He replied, go tell that fox. I will drive out demons and heal people today and tomorrow. And on a third day, I will reach my goal. In any case, I must keep going today and tomorrow and the next day. For surely no prophet can die outside of Jerusalem. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who killed the prophets and stoned those sent to you, how often I have longed to gather your children together as a hen, gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. Look, your house is left to you desolate. I tell you, you will not see me again until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Let us bow for just a moment of silent prayer in preparation. Amen. Have you ever known anybody who was truly courageous? You know, you, you read about people who do these wonderful, courageous things all the time, and sometimes I wonder, would I be able to do that? Or would I kind of shrink back in fear and, and let things kind of roll out in, in front of me? You know, I was reading the other day about the tsunami that hit Japan back in 2011. And, you know, it caused a nuclear accident at the nuclear reactor in Fukushima. And this man, Yamada was his name, he was watching on TV as these young men went into the radioactive zone. He was an engineer. And he thought to himself, these young men are going in there. And this is going to change their lives because of the radiation exposure. He said, why couldn't I go? I'm 75, you know, I've got maybe 10 years left. And so what he did, immediately gathered up 40 engineers, and they took the place of all those young men, men his age. They went in there knowing how dangerous it was, but they went anyway, thinking, would I have the courage to do that? Would I even have the mind to, to think of something like that, to be so concerned about someone else that I would lay my life on the line so that they could have theirs? You know, we see it in TV shows all the time. All the movies, these people do miraculous things to help somebody. People who respond to every emergency with a, let's go do it, let's go make it happen. You know, in the circus in Moscow, there was a, a lion tamer. And, and she was well known all over the Soviet Union. And she would close out her act. She would lay down her chair or whip and she would invite the lion to come up and hug her. It would nuzzle against her. And there was a man, and this applause would erupt everywhere. And when he got quiet, a man stood up and he said, well, that's nothing. I can do that. And the ringmaster said, do you think you could? He said, yes. And he said, come on down and get in the cage. And the man said, you get rid of the lion first, and I'll come hug the girl. <laughs> My kind of courage. You know, each morning when we wake up, we face a new challenge. Each time we turn the news on, we read about some new disaster. Earthquakes, tidal waves, volcanoes, tornadoes, hurricanes, school shootings. Terrible things are going on in our world, political and civil unrest. Wars and rumors of wars, like Jesus said. And so as we face every new day, I think sometimes we have to stop and ask, do I have the courage to really put my feet on the floor today? Maybe I'll just stay in bed. Pull the covers up over my head. I would do that if the dog didn't need out. <laughs> in our scripture lesson for today, we get an example of what Christian courage is all about. And we find our example in the life and the times and the words of our Savior, Jesus Christ. 
Jesus had been teaching from village to village throughout the area. And he was teaching about the kingdom of God. And he had the courage and the guts to tell things just the way they were. He looked at all the Jewish people who were gathered around him. He said, you know what? He said, just because you're a son or a daughter of Abraham does not mean that you're going to inherit the kingdom of God. You know, many things he said upset people. You know, it went against popular uh, uh, thoughts and ideas. He was always saying something controversial. And people were beginning to get angry. He said, in fact, not everybody will be there, but there will be much weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth outside the gates of the kingdom. He said, those who think of themselves first, guess what? They're going to be last. And those who you think are last, why, they're going to be first. Jesus' words caused a controversy. The Pharisees were getting upset. You remember the Pharisees, a, a political religious party that opposed Jesus on every side. They came to him and said, you better leave here. You better quit saying those kind of words. You know why? Because Herod is coming after you. There's a plot to kill you from Herod's court. The king is after you. And they, we examine the answer that Jesus gave to the Pharisees. We find our strength to live in an uncertain world when we are threatened on every side as Christian men and women, boys and girls. First of all, we realize that Jesus had complete dependence on God. And that dependence enabled him to do the things that he did. Let that fox come and get me if he wants me. But I got work to do. And I've got to finish that work. Because God sent me. And because God is with me in the task. Demons to cast out. People to heal. Words to say. Places to go. All of that. Remember Christ in the wilderness? When he was tempted of Satan? about turning the rocks into bread and, and throwing himself off the highest point of the temple and bowing to Satan as the kingdoms came before him. You know, each of those temptations was a temptation for a shortcut. You know, we like shortcuts, don't we? <laughs> you know, I was trying to figure out the quickest way to get out of Tyler today. From the donut shop that I stopped at first. <laughs> we like those shortcuts. Jesus knew what was waiting for him. Jesus knew there was a cross in his future. He could have taken any of those shortcuts. You know, you feed somebody, and you feed them all the time, and you feed them good, they'll come. They'll follow you. Jesus knew that. Satan knew that. His miraculous deeds were done only because he depended upon God, and he trusted God's plan and what God was doing. That principle is important for each of us. For truly, we cannot live by the bread that the world provides alone. We can only depend upon the words. The words that God has given us. Do not put the Lord your God to the test. Do not worship anything else other than God. We are to live confidently in God. Confidently in dependence. Independent or independence of the Lord's promise, His presence, and His help. Tell Herod to get out of here. And Jesus was able to say that because He knew where His power came from. He knew where He was going. He knew what was going on with Him. Jesus says, I can't worry about that. I have my Father's business to take care of. And you know, it's true for each of us. We have the Father's business to take care of. He's called us all not just to be in the pew. He's called us all not just to attend. I read a little comic this day. That said a couple got a letter from the church and they said, Oh no, we've been called up for active duty. We've all got that letter. Active duty. And we can do that because we go in the confidence that God goes with us. That same God who stood with Jesus... That same God who directed Jesus, that same God who empowered Jesus, is the God, the very God, whom we serve today. 
For countless generations, men and women have stood the ground, stood up for their faith, overcome great odds, and has demonstrated great acts of courage. Anybody see the movie Hacksaw Ridge? About um, uh, Desmond Doss, forgot his first name for a moment. How he wanted to be a medic, a conscientious ejector, and how he, under fire by himself, lowered 75 men to safety. And if you watch the movie, each time he got the one and got them down, you remember his little prayer? Lord, let me get one more. Let me get one more. You know, his prayer is almost like saying, I've got work to do, and I know you're with me. He accomplished great things, not on his own, but by the power and the strength and the belief that he had in God. And so can we. He is our help. He is our rock. He is our foundation and our power and strength. Jesus could face Herod and the Pharisees and all those who opposed him because he knew that he didn't stand alone. And neither do we. Jesus could have courage for that day because he knew he was living on God's time. On God's time. We so often want to live on our time, don't we? We want everything. I want this. And you know what? I want it right now. I know what I want and, and, and I need it now. We want what we want and we want it right now. A friend of the great preacher, Phyllis Brooks, once went in his office. And when he in there, Philip was walking up and down, pacing back and forth and back and forth. He was making his friend nervous, and he said, Philip, what is wrong? And he said, I'm in a hurry. And God isn't. How many times have we been there? In a hurry, only discover that God's not. And what do we do? We pause and we realize that it's not about our time, about what we want and when we want it. It's all about God's time. Our time leads to impatience. Our time leads to anxiety. Our time leads to poor decisions. Quick decisions that aren't thought out and aren't given over in prayer. I have made a bunch of those of you. I mean, we all have. I have several things in my closet that I bought on impulse and have never, ever used. Even now that I've downsized, I still have those things because I didn't get rid of them. I might need them someday. And to get rid of them would, would, to, would be to admit that I made a mistake, a poor decision. Jesus knew that God had a mission for him to accomplish, and he was working on God's time, not his own. And he knew that in God's time, not this disciple's time, not even in Herod's time, his work would be accomplished. Our lives will take on that same peaceful courage when we set aside our time and learn to live on God's time. You know, our time changes, what, twice a year? I hate it. But God's time never changes. It's always the same. It's always there. It's always a part of us when we will acknowledge it. And when in our hearts and our lives we acknowledge it, we will realize for ourselves that God may be a little slow by our standards. But He's never late. He always comes through. Remember, it took Noah six months to find a parking place. <laughs> Been to Walmart lately? It takes about that long. God always comes through in His time and not ours. And lastly, checking the time. <laughs> lastly, God brings about God's results. When we live in dependence of Him, when we live in His time, we'll discover that we become attuned with the results that He wants in our life. Attuned to the results that He wants in our world. Seminary students for the library, they were arguing. You know, that's what seminary students do. I didn't do that. I hung out where the folks were. <laughs> but they were arguing about the meaning of revelation. You know, everybody loves that. And they were arguing premillennialism and post-millennialism and amillennial, I can't even say it. And while they were arguing back and forth about all those 
stances on the book of Revelation, the janitor came up sweeping as he came by, and he said, you know, I know what Revelation means. He kind of scoffed, <laughs> and they thought, hey, we've got all this education. I mean, you can't even spell millennialism. And he looked at him, and he said, I've read the book from beginning to end. You know what Revelation means? It means that God wins in the end. We'll sweat out the end. God wins in the end. That's all we need to know. That's all we need to know. If we, if we live in dependence, if we live in His time, God is going to bring about His result. And it's better for us if we live looking for His result. Remember the village, the Samaritan village that rejected Christ? The disciples were angry. They were really mad. And they looked to Jesus and he said, let us call down fire from heaven and destroy this village like Sodom and Gomorrah. That will teach them a lesson. <laughs> but that wasn't God's purpose, God's plan. Jesus looked at him and said, no way. He rebuked them. He said, that's not what God wants. And they went on to another village and there they found hospitality. Too many times, even with God, we may not say it, but we live it. We want to go all Frank Sinatra and say, I want to do it my way. Jesus knew God's way. In the Gospel of John, John tells us that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and there wasn't anything in the universe made without the Word being there, without Jesus being there. You know, I, I think I've told it to you before. And probably did. I don't remember. But the way we look at life is like watching a parade through a knot hole in a fence. You know what you see? You see one little thing at a time. One little thing at a time. You can't see the beginning. You can't see the end. But God and Jesus were sitting on top of the fence when the world was made. They knew the beginning. And they also know the end. Yeah, we might be afraid about what's going on in our world today. Our hearts may shake, and we may think that we can't live the courageous lives. But we got, have to remember that God knows the way. And in the end, God wins. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, in this uncertain time that we all live in, a time, Father, when so much is going on around us to bring fear into our hearts and lives to so much that, Lord, just makes us quake in, 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 our, in our shoes and so much going on and, and we just pray, Father, that you would help us to remember your strength, help us to remember your way, help us, Lord, not depend upon our own selves, our own way, our own time, looking for our own results, but let us, Father, look for yours, your presence, your life, your love, your grace, and your promise to be with us now and even to the end of this age. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
Who are we? We are God's family. We have come to worship the Lord and to give Him praise. Now we are sent by God to be fully devoted disciples of Jesus. Thank you, Lord God, for the way you love us. We ask you now to lead us by your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name.